more than a million earthquakes occur each year. They are caused by the release of tension stored up in the Earth's crust. What happens inside the Earth to cause this release? There are times when the Earth isn't as stable as it seems. And it just kept coming, and it kept coming, and it kept coming again. And it was like riding a roller coaster. It was really a rocking and rolling. I just, in my wildest imagination, had no comprehension that Mother Nature could be that destructive and just, you know, Every year, more than a million earthquakes rattle our world. We don't notice most of them, but the ones we do give us new respect for our planet. Earthquakes happen when tension stored in the Earth's crust is suddenly released. To understand what causes these disasters, we need to travel to the center of the Earth. The enormous heat and energy here shapes the layers above, especially the Earth's outer crust. We can think of the crust as a jigsaw puzzle divided into about 12 tectonic plates. These giant slabs of rock hold the continents and the ocean floor. For millions of years, they've been drifting and colliding, pushed by the churning liquid mantle below. When they slip, grind, and crunch past each other, disasters occur. Some of the worst quakes happen when the plates get stuck and pressure builds. When they finally break free, energy is released as waves traveling through the ground. Geologist David Schwartz describes the process. The plates are moving past each other, they're pushing against each other. When the stress builds up to a critical point, they snap, and the snapping the, of the plates basically produces the seismic waves that nets the earthquake. These disasters usually occur at the boundaries between two plates. This is where we find faults, cracks and fractures in the Earth's crust where the plates inch along. Geophysicist Ross Stein explains. These faults typically at their base, let's say 10 miles down, are moving at a few inches a year. And when that earthquake occurs, when that rupture begins, that fault, that motion is going to accelerate from a few inches a year to about 5,000 miles an hour. And it's going to do that in three seconds. So this rupture of the fault is a catastrophic process, unlike hardly anything else in nature. Like ripples in water, the vibrations spread out in all directions, shaking everything in their path. The strongest shaking occurs at the epicenter, the place on the Earth's surface directly above the spot where the earthquake began. One of the worst quakes on record struck Alaska in 1964. It measured 9.2 on the moment magnitude scale, a scale that measures the energy released by a quake. The shaking lasted around four minutes, which is a long time for an earthquake. The ground ripped open and in some places sank more than 15 meters. We know how earthquakes happen and the great destruction they create. But unfortunately, we still can't predict them. OK, there we go. So we're going to be talking about earthquakes today. And uh, a lot of us don't have much experience with earthquakes because we do live in the heartland of America. Uh, but what we'll find out as we go here is that uh, we're not immune from these things. These things can happen here. Um, 
and they can be really, really destructive in particular because uh, our area is really not earthquake proof. We don't really plan to have a lot of earthquakes. So uh, when they do occur, uh, it can be real destructive. So let's take a look here at the causes of earthquakes and kind of how they work a little bit. Here we go. So an earthquake is just a sudden vibration produced by the moving of tectonic plates when that energy gets released. And if you're following along on your questions on your quiz there, uh, you're going to be able to answer a bunch of those right here. So just kind of take a look, make sure you're following along. Uh, two words, the focus and the epicenter of the earthquake. This is right on your quiz. The focus is the point inside the earth where the earthquake actually starts. So think of this as, as it could be very, very deep underground. It could be shallower. Um, it just depends on the type of earthquake and what's causing it. But the focus is the part deep underground. The epicenter is the part that's right on top of the surface. So when uh, seis seismographs uh, help us locate the epicenter of the earthquake, uh, and you hear about it on the news, the epicenter was located in such and such location, um, like such and such miles outside of some city, we're talking about a place right on the surface that's above the focus where the earthquake actually occurred. So the greatest shaking is always, almost always going to happen right on the epicenter, the place above where the, where the crack in the quake starts. Um, now the word fault just refers to any crack uh, where the earth's actually moved. Okay, there's a lot of different types of faults that occur, but it's where the slippage actually happened, where the energy was released. Okay, everybody have that one? Good? Okay. So to take a look at where those are actually in relation to each other, uh, this kind of help out a little bit. Uh, we've got the uh, epicenter is that red dot there on the top around the edge of this diagram. And then if we go underground, right directly beneath it is the focus. The fault itself may go at an angle. It may not go vertically up and down. So somewhere along that will be, will be the focus of where the earthquake, where the slippage actually occurred right? Um, the waves then spread out kind of in a circular pattern from that in all directions. Okay. The fault scarp is that uh, chain of like uh, uplifted stuff there that's, that's slid. Let's take a look at some slippage along a fault. So when a fault moves, and if you look closely at this picture, you will see uh, these used to be planted in rows, and you can see all these little bushes here. Notice the line of bushes where they have all slid past each other. They, I mean, they've moved almost an entire bush. If they'd have gone just a little bit further, it might have lined up again. So um, we can see this in fence lines. All sorts of objects that humans create uh, show us how the earth is moving, like, like very precisely, because you can make a really easy measurement between where those trees were or bushes were and where they are now. So um, it can move quite a bit sometimes. All right, what can cause an earthquake? So this is known as elastic rebound hypothesis. Um, earthquakes are produced, uh, most of them are, by a real rapid release of elastic energy that's stored up inside rock. So you can think of the rock as being, these forces being pushed on the rock and pushed on the rock until it finally just gives way and releases that energy and springs back. Now I'm not gonna break my meter bar here, but um, you could think of it a lot like this meter bar, and I think I've got a picture of this in the next slide. Uh, if I put pressure on both sides of the meter bar and keep pressing it and pressing it and pressing it, eventually that thing's gonna break. And when it does, the part where it breaks is gonna move very, very rapidly, um, and that would be what would cause the earthquake. So it's kind of elastic rebound in the sense that when that meter bar breaks, it rebounds back to its original position. It's like elastic, it's bendy. Okay, but it's only bendy so far before it just straight breaks. Let's take a look at a picture that I was just describing there. So we've got a guy here who's got the, a meter bar, and he's bending it, bending it, bending it. Energy's building up, building up. Just like the rocks over there on the left, they're still stuck together, right? But there's a lot of pressure on them. They're, they're, they're bending, they're, they're twisting. And then when this finally ruptures, the earthquake releases all that energy in the, in the plate slide, okay, along that fault line. Got it? Okay, let's talk aftershocks and foreshocks. 
So earthquakes usually don't occur entirely in isolation. It's not like there's, there's no lead up and no trailing parts of an earthquake. A lot of the time, there are what are known as uh, foreshocks, like in other words, small slippages, the, the, the pieces of the fault slide a little bit and give these little foreshocks that come before, and then uh, the big one happens, boom, and then afterwards there's another series of smaller ones. If you've ever seen videos or movies of people in earthquakes, um, a lot of the time you'll see, you know, there's some rumbling, some shaking, uh, maybe there's enough time for folks to take cover, uh, get out of the way of dangerous buildings and things like that, and then all of a sudden the big one hits, and then there's followed by a series of smaller ones. Um, that's, that's really pretty common. Um, now, the foreshocks don't happen so long before that they really give us a whole lot of help making long-term predictions, but uh, they do usually come right before and then there's some that come after the main earthquake. Anybody have that one on their quiz? All right, let's talk about some of the ways that we find earthquakes. So two words here, seismographs and seismograms uh, are very similar. The seismograph is the actual instrument that records the shaking. Uh, these things have like basically a pendulum arm that hangs and then the bottom part is bolted to the earth and when the earth shakes, the platter that it's drawing on shakes back and forth and the pendulum ar arm stays put so it draws a squiggle. Um, we have one of these at IU down in the basement of the geology building and it's pretty much running all the time unless it's broken. And it's so sensitive that we can pick up vibrations on that thing from trains that pass by. When a train passes by the IU Geology Building, uh, the seismograph shakes. In fact, when they do blasting uh, south of Bloomington, like down in Bedford, like when they're, when they're mining for limestone, things like that, if there's a blast, they pick that up on that seismograph and they can determine exactly what it was. Um, and if they have three seismographs, they could figure out pinpoint its location exactly. In fact, we use seismographs to this day to help us understand when other countries are doing things like testing nuclear weapons. Right? If, if uh, North Korea tests a nuke underground, which they do, sometimes we pick that, that shock wave up, that vibration, all the way over here in America. Now you're not gonna feel it, but the seismographs can pick it up and we can pinpoint the location where it occurred we can even give an estimate of how strong it was, like what they might have detonated underground. So these things are useful outside of uh, geology. A seismogram is just the trace, the, the kind of the trace of the, that's happening on that paper from the seismograph. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Uh, we're gonna talk about surface waves. So these are the waves that travel along Earth's outer layer, along the surface of the Earth. Here's a picture of a seismograph creating a seismogram. So you've kind of got, there's different types of these, but usually there's a rotating drum with some paper that keeps going past it so you can just you know, keep this going. And then you can see that pendulum there. The pendulum hangs uh, without motion because there's a weight on it there. And then when the shaking, this thing's bolted into the bedrock, when the shaking happens, it wiggles the paper back and forth. So the pen just writes on the paper as the paper writes, wiggles back and forth. Okay. It's usually how these things are set up. There's different ways of doing it. And then you'll get a seismogram off of that. Okay, so you can actually use these, and we might in here. It's a little bit more complex, but you can, by measuring the distance between the types of waves that occur, oops, by measuring the distance between the types of waves that occur, we can actually determine the distance to the earthquake, how far it was away from that particular seismograph. Okay, let's talk about some body waves here. So uh, the surface waves, like I said, are the ones that travel along the surface. There's two main types of body waves, and you can see them there, the P and the S. Okay. Let's talk about P and S waves. So uh, this is gonna be on your questions here, and there's gonna be a couple questions about them, so try and pay attention here. P waves are push-pull waves that push and compress and then pull and expand the rock and whatever they're passing through um, in the direction that they're going. So you could think of, if I had a slinky, I usually bring one up here, I'll try and grab one sometime. If I pull on the slinky and let go, 
it will create this shock wave that bounces back and forth, right? It compresses and rarefies and kind of pushes through. These things, these P waves, can travel through solids, liquids, and gases. So they can go through just about anything. They've got the greatest velocity of all the earthquake waves, so they're going to arrive first. You could think of P like as push-pull, so that's a good way to remember it. Or P really stands for primary. They're the first waves to arrive, okay? Got it? Let's talk about S waves. So S waves, they also travel along Earth's outer layers. These things shake. So you could think of S as shake, even though it kind of means secondary. So these things shake particles at right angles to the direction they're traveling. So if, if they're traveling forwards, they're shaking right to left as they go forward. So it'd be kind of like me shaking a slinky up and down or side to side be a better description of it. So these things can only travel through solids and they go slower than P waves. So they arrive secondarily, hence S waves. So uh, a seismograph is gonna show all three types of these waves. We'll see the P waves, we'll see the S waves, we'll see the surface waves. And there's some different types of surface waves as well. Everybody good? Here's what this might look like if we're uh, looking at the actual Earth, okay? It's a little hard to read this here. So uh, the top diagram right there is the back and forth motion that's produced by P waves. So they, when they travel along the surface, uh, they can cause the ground to kind of buckle and fracture. So you can think of it being compressed and pulled apart and compressed and pulled apart. It kind of crinkles, almost like you'd crinkle up a slinky and then expand it back out. Okay. Then the S waves will, will shake up and down and sideways. So as they're traveling forward in that next picture, the ground lifts and falls, lifts and falls, or goes side to side. And there's some other types of surface waves as well that move the ground side to side and kind of roll it even in almost like a rolling motion. Um, okay. Cool. Okay, so how do we figure out distance and location of an earthquake? So the first thing here, distance, what we do is we, we locate the epicenter, okay, which is the area where the earthquake uh, occurred most strongly on the surface. Okay. Um, it's above the focus. And we do that by using the difference in arrival times of the P and S waves. So remember, the P waves get there first, the S waves come in right behind them. The, the amount of lag between those can give us the distance exactly so we know how far away it is. Okay. Now, if we have three of these seismograms, seismographs set up around the country in different locations, we can triangulate a location. For instance, if you've got one in California and you know the distance between the P and the S waves, and you've got one in Indiana and you know the distance between the P and the S waves, and you've got one in, say, Kentucky, and you know the distance in the P and the S waves, you can then figure out, like basically draw a line from each of those to locate precisely where the earthquake occurred. So this is how it's done. But you need three. You need at least three uh, seismographs to pull this off, to triangulate a location. Um, most of the Earth's earthquakes occur in just a few narrow locations. There's a few locations where almost all of our earthquakes occur. And not surprisingly, those are plate boundaries. So here's an example of a time travel graph. If you look here, they've triangulated that earthquake there um, right between uh, South America and Africa there. You see the epicenter. Uh, and the way that's done is they've got a couple of different seismographs here. They have a seismograph in Montreal, and that one determines that this thing happens to be uh, 8,400 kilometers away. So if you draw a circle around that point right there, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one I'm pointing at there. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, you draw a circle around that that's 8,400 kilometers in radius, the earthquake has to be along that circle somewhere. 
Okay? And then there's one over here in Paris, and the Paris uh, measurement tells us it's 6,700 kilometers away. If you draw a circle around that with a radius of 6,700 kilometers, it has to be somewhere along that. So where those two cross is going to be the epicenter. Right? We, we really do need a third station, and in Sao Paulo here, Sao Paulo here, they've got one and it measures very close, only 5,500 kilometers away. And you draw that circle and it's going to coincide right there where that dot is, where all the epicenters meet. So when you're looking at these actual graphs, if you had the actual seismograph from one of these instruments, what you'd see is these shaky lines, okay? And if we put them on this, on this graph like this, you can figure out what the P wave curve is. Okay, this is kind of given based on, on distance, which is just like a given value, and so is the S wave curve. You overlay that, and you measure the distance between those two, and you have your time travel. Okay. That's usually how it's done. So historically, we've had some different ways of measuring earthquakes, some different scales. Uh, turns out that there's some scales that are better, some scales that are worse. Uh, the two types of measurements we make on an earthquake are intensity and magnitude. We'll talk intensity a little bit later on, but magnitude I want to talk right now. And you might have heard of the Richter scale. So the Richter scale is, is an old scale. Uh, I, when I grew up uh, and I took Earth space in high school, we learned the Richter scale. I don't think the other scales were even out yet. They definitely weren't in our textbooks. Um, and the Richter scale, we found that it doesn't really work well for really large earthquakes. Like it gives you a wrong value when you're talking about really, really big earthquakes. So the Richter scale really isn't used much anymore. Okay? But uh, if you're looking at it, th there's some pretty big jumps on the Richter scale. And they, what they would do is they would use the amplitude of the largest wave that came, like how big the largest squiggle was on that paper. Um, and each unit on the scale, going up the scale, would give you a 32-fold energy increase. That's a big jump. Okay? So we've modified this. We no longer use the Richter scale so much anymore. You sometimes hear about it, but really what scientists are using is something known as moment magnitude. Okay. And what this actually measures is the amount of displacement along the fault zone. So you go to the actual fault and you make a measurement of how much movement there's really been. Okay. And this is right now is the most widely used measurement that we have for earthquakes because it's the only magnitude scale that really estimates properly the energy that's released by the earthquakes. Uh, so it does a good job of measuring small earthquakes, does a good job of measuring large earthquakes. Um, but the problem is it takes time. Like you have to go there and make the measurement. Versus the Richter scale, if an earthquake goes off, we can immediately give you a value on the Richter scale because the jiggle came in, the wiggle on the line came in. We could just measure that line and tell you, oh, it's a you know, magnitude six on the Richter scale. Okay, but then scientists later have to go back and make the measurement to figure out the moment magnitude. But th that's the value that we use. So if we look at some big earthquakes here, uh, we could take a look at some of these, some of the big magnitude earthquakes that have occurred and sort of what they do. So with a moment magnitude of less than two, uh, you're not really gonna feel them but you can, we can record them. Like I said, we can pick up like a train going by on the train tracks outside of the IU Geo building. You might feel one that's about a 2 to a 2.9. A lot of folks don't even notice up to a 3, almost a 4. By the time it gets to a 4 to a 4.9, you can feel this. Like it's going to shake some stuff. Around a 5 to a 5.9, we're talking about some damaging shocks, like some buildings are probably going to be damaged. Okay, some things are going to fall off your shelves. At a 6 to a 6.9, uh, areas that have a lot of people, are, it's going to be really destructive. There's a lot of city, a lot of built up materials. Um, you're talking about some major damage. Okay. At a 7 to a 7.9, of course, even more damage. Above an 8, uh, we're talking destruction. If, it, if the community happens to be near the epicenter where this thing goes off, it's getting leveled, right? Like serious destruction. And you can look at the estimated numbers per year. We don't have many of them eight or above, like every year. 
like across the entire world, right? Um, serious ones, you might have around about 12 or so a year. Okay, but the really big ones are, are pretty rare. Here are some of the bigger quakes that have happened. Looking at this, um, let's see. Let's take a look. There's some interesting features here. We can look at the magnitudes. What's the biggest magnitude here? I think it's the 9.6 there um, in southern Chile. So uh, the deaths for that, where this thing went off, were 5,700 people died. Okay, this might be the largest earthquake that's ever occurred on our planet. Okay. That was in 1960. Let's look at one that had a few more deaths, though. So. Look at this one in Tokyo, Japan. 143,000 deaths. Right? It was only a 7.9, so, so considerably less than the one in Chile. So what was the difference there? Well, the difference typically is how far the city is away from the actual epicenter. So that one in Chile, probably there weren't built up buildings that were super close to it. There wasn't a huge population. Versus the one in Japan, like a lot of people were right there. There was a lot of fires. Uh, cities were completely destroyed. So that could really mean the whole difference, right? How far away the city is, how many people are there, how prepared they are, those sort of things. Okay, so you should be able to answer all your questions now. You can go ahead and close that quiz out.